All right. So uh, has anybody heard of any of these words? Raise your hand. Uh, ah, yes, Robert Jackson, exactly. So thank you very much for enjoying that point of the presentation. I work massively better if you troll me while I'm talking. Uh, it is, it'll be a much more ener energetic, engaging uh, situation. So, uh, get, uh, you know, the gauntlet's been thrown down. Good luck. See what happens. See who can knock me off my stride the best. Uh, my money's on Runspired, but we'll see. Uh, all right, so a little bit about me. Um, I, uh, I did, this is a picture from Friday night. I had to include it in my slides. Uh, I accidentally picked this apron, um, but uh, I went with it. It worked. It worked. Um, I, I'm not showing you the painting that I was painting at the time because it's basically not recognizable as anything but just noise. So it seems good. It's about how I do software. So um, uh, I, uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm on the Ember core team and a smattering of other uh, Ember-related teams and maintain a ton of uh, open source projects, a few hundred. Uh, unfortunately, please come see me afterwards if you want to adopt anything. Um, and uh, just generally have a problem with open source, uh, mostly just the community aspect of it uh, is so engaging and exciting and fun uh, that I, I really just get a ton of enjoyment out of it. Um, so I, I tend to just take on more and more and more, um, but y'all make it so much fun that it doesn't really feel like work. Uh, and who needs sleep anyways, right? Um, as, uh, as Casey mentioned, I, I work at LinkedIn. Um, it's quite awesome. I will be completely candid and tell you that I am happy at work for the first time in many, many years. So it is awesome. And they're awesome. You should come see the booth. Uh, a bunch of folks will be up there. Uh, tomorrow uh, through, through the conference. Okay, so before we get going into any topics, um, whenever I give a talk, I like to give a shout out to my family. Uh, they almost never can make it and come to the talks, and they're almost always the ones suffering from me being here. Uh, so I like to give a shout out and thank them for supporting me and letting me do the things that I do um, and just being awesome in general. Okay. So I know you don't really care about additions at all. Uh, all you're really here for is Octane and cool things. And because like, hey, you have a ticket to this room and might as well have a nice seat for the rest of the next uh, half hour, 45 minutes. So, uh, but I'm gonna make you sit here and listen to me talk about additions for a minute. Um, so good luck. Um, so the first question is, uh, what, uh, what, what is the landscape today? Like what, what we're adding additions, great. Um, but what do we already have? So, um, so I'm just going to do a quick run through of, uh, of, of all the different other avenues that we have. Uh, the first one is Canary. Um, so for those of you that are familiar with the Canary concept, um, it's basically where features land first. We land features behind a flag, uh, and then we uh, enable the flag on Canary once it's like ready to go. Uh, during the period of time that a feature has landed on Canary, but before it's enabled, you can usually try to opt into it by using like a very dangerous canary sha, uh, and uh, hopefully it doesn't break you. Um, and you can give us feedback, and it's awesome, and we love that. Um, as I mentioned uh, before, by very dangerous, uh, there's actually no support. You can file an issues, and we love issues. Please file issues. Uh, but we really love PRs. So feel free. Uh, PRs welcome, as they say, kids these days. Um, all right, so the next one down the line is uh, once the features and things are ready, uh, they, uh, every six weeks we cut a new beta, and then there is six weekly betas, and thankfully, uh, Kate Gangler is doing awesome, and she's actually releasing them all. So when I was doing it, I basically, so she told me, um, she took over, maybe I had been doing it for a couple of years, and she took over, she said, hey Rob, uh, the, I have to do a beta at six, but I see we've never actually done six before. So yeah, so she's awesome and is actually really great um, to have to have help, and we kind of collaborate. She like like I said, she does all the work, but um, uh, it's it's a great process. So when uh, when the features are ready on Canary, like I said, we enable them, uh, and then after they're enabled, 
they uh, sort of flow down during the next beta cycle. Uh, and that's when uh, we're doing tagged releases to NPM and folks can uh, clone and, uh, sorry, they can uh, update their apps to the tags. Most add-ons uh, test by default against both uh, beta and canary. Um, and uh, an attempt to like identify any the, like, breakages from, uh, from you know, on the Ember side with the add-on, the add-ons test suite. Um, still a little bit of things to make better here in this process, but I think it's, this part is fairly good. The thing that would be uh, really helpful is if more app developers and more apps tested against beta, um, and, and hopefully Canary, but beta at least, um, because oftentimes the test suites of add-ons test their own functionality, but they often don't test um, some things that would only really exist in apps. For example, like you can imagine if there's a bug in like Link2, most add-ons aren't gonna have Link2, like things testing Link2, because like add-ons don't generally provide routes and routing systems. Um, so those kinds of things, like they unfortunately could trickle down to a stable release if we don't catch them. So um, you heard it here first, or maybe for the 10,000th time, who cares, uh, it'll be fine. Um, you should test your apps in beta. Um, so the point of the beta is that like features can stabilize, we can test the coherent group of features together um, and, uh, and prepare for the final stable release. Uh, and then we get to the release. Um, so release ideally only has one and it's just a point zero and everything's perfect because everyone tested all the things and there's no problems because we all write perfect code uh, and uh, you know, but that's not true, but hey, whatever, we can dream. Um, so we, we typically have a couple of, uh, you know, patch releases, bug fix releases, et cetera, during this period um, as, as new issues are, uh, are reported and tested. We try to filter them back down. Um, once we get to the release time frame, um, most things, most changes have had at least 12 weeks uh, between when they landed through uh, when they're released. So they've had quite a lot of time and, and testing from like add-ons and uh, other apps and uh, apps upgrading. We tend to have lots more early testers when there's like a key feature that we're really, people are really ch chomping at the bit to get. Um, so so those, are, those releases are typically more well tested. Um, but again, uh, the whole point of the release is to be the stable thing and lots of, lots of folks just have a policy not to update past a, a release. Like they don't go, they don't go to beta um, on master of their app. Uh, until, uh, you know, and then it trickles down to release. Okay, so then the, uh, the, the question here is, okay, so how do these channels relate to Semver? Um, Semver is uh, just this nasty six letter word. I'm sure you've heard of it. Um, anyways, how do, they, uh, how do they relate to Semver? So usually we'll, uh, Semver says you introduce uh, new features in minor versions uh, and major versions uh, do not introduce new features. This is this is Ember's take on uh, what what we do with majors. So, the as those of you that have been around since the you know one x to two or two to three, hopefully two to three. You don't remember the other thing. Uh, well, we won't talk about that again. Um, I hope. Um, so uh, so for those of you who've been around, you'll know that what we try to do is introduce all the new features in the in the prior major, like in the two x series. Then deprecate the things that are going to be removed in three, so that the upgrade from 2.18. whatever to three is uh, as simple as fixing all the deprecations, right? Uh, that's the that's the pitch. That is the dream. Um, so if we do that, so now lots of people uh, in the industry uh, are using major versions to add new features. They're adding things. It's a big marketing release. It's a big push. Yay! Hey, look at me. We're version 25. 25. Uh, because you know why, why not? Um, the, uh, so, uh, oh, hey, I missed that slide. So why isn't that enough? So, so lots of folks, like I said, they, they, it's nice to have a rallying cry. It's nice to have a thing where you can say, hey, look at all this awesome work that we did. Um, minor releases, nobody gets excited about minor releases, unless you're a TypeScript and then you don't actually follow Semver, but you pretend like you do because you pick numbers that look like Semver, <laughs> unless that. Um, anyways, so, uh, this, this, this is your quote from you already. So just what the heck is an addition? Um, so, so here we go. Uh, so additions are a new release type. Um, so they're along the lines of uh, Canary Beta release and LTS, but it's like a different thing and it's basically unrelated to those directly, but it's, it's a nice, comprehensive, coherent um, picture into 
the set of features that we've introduced into the programming model. So and by programming model, I mean the way that you're supposed to be thinking about building apps. So if you were around in the early 1.x's, that program, oh damn it, I said I wasn't gonna say it. Uh, that programming model was basically like views and like container view and stuff like that. Um, so, and, and, and then we, you know, then we went very, we started the slow progression away from that mental model towards like components and component invocation and all that stuff. So, but th that middle period, it was like this transi transitionary period and it wasn't fully coherent. You couldn't really look at the guides or look at the docs and know this is exactly what uh, I'm trying to do. Th this is how I have to do a thing. Um, but, uh, but once it was done, uh, it was a coherent point in time to think about and look at programming and coding and ever. So, so addition is just a way for us to declare that, hey, we have finally reached coherence. This set of features that we've been working on for uh, many years uh, is ready to use and is a good thing to adopt and start looking at. It also is a nice um, rallying cry to have folks that are outside the Ember ecosystem come and look and say, hey, look, things changed. Uh, let me get an insight of what's going on with Ember. Um, so, uh, so those, that's basically the rough uh, idea here. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, so why aren't, uh, so what are additions not supposed to be doing? So additions are not tied to a version. They're not about versions. They're about coherent sets of features, groups of features together that let you think about a thing. Now, of course, when we coin the addition, it'll be as of a given version. But the addition's not about the version. The addition's about the set of features to think about together. Um, so, um, so, so they're also not about adding features. The addition should not add features. The, the feature should have already landed. The feature should have landed well before the addition's being cut. Um, and uh, and uh, ironically, the addition's RFC is actually not merged yet, but we're about to have an addition, so. Anyways, a little troll there. Uh, okay, so this is what you're here for. You care about Octane or, you know, a seat, either way. So one way, you're already happy. This way, I might get to Octane and we'll talk about some stuff. Um, so, okay, so first of all, uh, the RFC here that, that most of the things that we're talking about uh, was laid out and in, in coined the first edition as Octane uh, is this RFC number 364. Um, it was uh, merged uh, in November of 2018, yet ironically, it is the 2018 roadmap. <laughs> hmm, okay. Uh, anyways, so, so here's the things it says. Um, it said, uh, so there's two main sections, probably the most confusing thing about the whole thing. Uh, there's a section on finish what we started, um, and that includes things like uh, Broccoli 2.0, which was uh, a major uh, rev to the build pipeline that, that we use in number CLI. Um, prior to uh, prior to the Broccoli 2.0 um, in Ember CLI 3.4, I think is when it landed. Uh, prior to that, we were using Broccoli 0.16 or something, which was quite old. 1.0 had been released like over a year prior, um, and we just there were some mismatches that made it impossible to upgrade. The beauty of Broccoli 2.0 and the reason why you, uh, folks um, should care is it lets us get rid of the temp directory in the project. Um, and that was pretty awesome. Um, has lots of positive side effects, uh, like making your editor not want to crash every time you do a build, for example. Um, so it also included things like uh, f the new file layout, which we had previously called the RFC module unification. Um, now, unfortunately, and this is the only mention of module unification in this talk, uh, and the reason is, um, as is those that uh, have been watching the embergs.com slash blog, uh, you'll see that um, we decided to remove module unification as a headliner feature, if you will, from, uh, from Octane, uh, mostly because including it would have made Octane in general just less polished, less stable, less complete, not because we think it is not something useful. We still absolutely believe in the new file structure and think that it is the right path forward. It's just a timing um, issue and just uh, getting things polished is actually quite important for this edition concept. Okay, so then we talk about Glimmer components, um, which we'll get into a lot more later, so we're not gonna go into too much detail here, but please note the quotes here. <laughs> I'll come back to that. Um, and then using native ES classes, uh, instead of 
Ember is like, what is this weird dot extend thing? You know, like you ever had those youngsters ask you about that when they come into the code base? You know, the answer, just so you know, is get off my lawn. All right. <laughs> so just just so you know. All right. Uh, and then uh, how come I have all these stupid add-ons that just wrap some other NPM package just to import the thing? This is dumb. Why can't I just do this other thing? Um, first of all, it's not nice to say things are dumb. Um, people worked hard on that. You should appreciate that. Um, but yeah, it's kind of dumb. So, uh, so <laughs> that's also a thing that uh, we wanted to finish and uh, get, on, get on with. Um, oh, hey, look at that. <laughs> All right, so, um, so now this is the other section of the RFC. I told you it was com complicated and confusing. Um, and this includes like the new features. Now, these features that I'm listing here are mostly the ones that I care about and I want to talk about. Um, there is uh, probably other things that will also be included in Octane that uh, are a little bit um, sort of, you know, under the covers, not as big a deal, but, uh, but th so these are the ones I'm going to talk about. Hey, I learned something. Um, so the first one is, uh, we're not going to ship jQuery by default. Um, so Octane apps, uh, so we've been working for a long time to remove the uh, built-in jQuery-isms that were fundamentally required. Not because there's anything wrong with jQuery, and if you use jQuery in your app, it's totally fine. That's supported. The thing that seemed like a mismatch these days was Ember itself fundamentally requiring jQuery. Um, so, so we've removed that. Because discovering that you could turn off jQuery was apparently very hard, uh, um, like people just didn't go and look for it because they didn't, it was a problem they didn't know they had. It, uh, they had. Um, and uh, uh, we've decided to make no, uh, not shipping with jQuery the default in, uh, in Octane. So, um, so when you generate a new Octane app, which you can do with the Octane Blueprint, um, it just won't have jQuery. Um, it comes with fetch. Um, Ember fetch uh, is how that is provided in browsers that uh, don't support fetch uh, naturally. Um, and it works great. Um, all right, so let's talk about native classes. So, um, so this is that, uh, that, that weird, uh, dot extend syntax, which I will say way predates classes for sure, for real. Um, and, uh, and so this is the before, and, uh, and this, is, this is what you can write now uh, in Octane. Now, this, this has been supported in Ember for a really long time. Like it just, it has worked for a long time because the thing that dot extend does is basically just using the normal JavaScript primitives to do prototypal inheritance. That's just how it worked internally. But nobody knew that, uh, or not many people knew that. Um, so uh, the, I mean, you have that constant conversation and you have to tell people to get off your lawn and eventually you just gotta put a sign out there and realize that probably you should just like mow your lawn or let it grow out and people don't wanna walk on it, something like that. Get a big dog, I don't know. Um, the, uh, but anyways, you can use classes. Classes are great. Um, and, uh, and I think this is, this is awesome. Like the, if you learn JavaScript today, you're gonna have learned classes. Classes is an awesome feature. Uh, and um, it's, it's, all, it's great to be able to just leverage them. You don't have to explain it. It's just like, if you know JavaScript, you'll know this. And I think that's a selling point for a lot of the Octane features. Um, it just feels more natural, um, and it works a little bit better. Um, okay, so let's talk about tracked properties. So, um, so if you've used, uh, if you've written an app or worked in an app, you've probably used computer properties before. Um, there's a few things about this that uh, are a tad bit uh, frustrating to folks uh, when they have to write a bunch of them. Uh, uh, for example, um, the, the fact that you have to re repeat the, oh, I got a typo here. So be, the fact that you have to repeat the dependent keys, um, I changed it from first name to first and last because it wouldn't fit on the slide uh, on the next line down. But hey, good job. So. Uh, so anyways, so you have to repeat the, the, the dependent keys, and the dependent keys aren't just like auto-inferred for you, and that feels like repetitive, and like, ah, don't repeat yourself. Um, yeah, so anyways, so that, that felt a little bit annoying. Um, so, um, so uh, but also, it, it makes it a little bit difficult and error-prone to manage uh, complex dependency graphs of how you update and how you can ensure your computer properties invalidate and whatnot. Um, where what you really want to do is you really want to say, what are, the, what are the leaf states? What are the, what are the root things that you care about um, mutating? And then the rest is just JavaScript. Um, in this case, this, this person class marks first name and last name as tracked. 
Um, so whenever they're assigned with normal JavaScript assignment, so like object dot first name equals Robert, um, it'll it'll mark it as dirty, and the rendering engine will pick up and re-render the thing, and that's it. Um, even if you just use full name, it automatically sees that hey, I'm depending on this track property, and uh, and just just works, quote unquote. Um, the uh, the nice thing also is that there's no there's n there's no hidden magic here uh, from from like the JavaScript perspective. If you call full name three times in a row, it's executing that getter three times in a row, just like you'd expect. So if you do want memoization, uh, you just add it, and you can do it yourself. It's not that hard. It's just JavaScript. Remember, this is what we wanted, isn't it? Um, so, uh, but but seriously, I think um, I know that's sort of trolling, but um, but really, it removes a lot of the what the heck is going on uh, from from the thing. You can just step in to the template and see the code calling your getter, and it just works. And there's no weird Ember stack stuff going on. Um, anyways, very nice. Uh, okay, glimmer components. Uh, all right, so let's talk a little bit about what was wrong with what we had before, because I know that's what you're all thinking. Um, so, so Ember component is what we've been using since Ember 1.0, um, and um, Ember component has lots of API service, like a ton. Um, 13 standard lifecycle hooks, nine, uh, 29 event handler methods, nine element customization properties like class names and attribute bindings and tag name and all that jazz. Uh, and then 21 framework functions, whatever that means. Uh, things like this.get, this.set, and whatnot, right? Um, but 21 of them. So this is the service area of Ember Component. I was going to put all the actual methods, but it wouldn't fit on the slide, so I just give you numbers. But you can imagine, that's a lot of stuff. You probably don't remember all that stuff, right? Uh, this is the API of Glimmer Component. Um, like, that's the whole API. That is it. Um, there are only... Uh, the only constructor and will destroy it as functions, and then a few properties. Um, and the only reason is destroying and is destroyed is there is for nice interoperability with um, other uh, other ecosystem things like uh, Ember concurrency or Ember Lifeline and whatnot. Um, so this is a much simpler mental model. Um, you don't have to know all of the things in the world. Um, but the question you're asking is, well, how do I do all the things? Well, here's an example of converting a um, uh, Ember component to uh, Glimmer component, and you, um, I mean, you'll notice this looks basically like the other example, but, uh, you know, you just mark the leafs as tracked, um, your args are all automatically tracked, um, and, um, and any getters you use from the template uh, are automatically tracking any tracked properties you have. Even if, so in this case, I didn't have any complex examples where you go through services and nested property paths, but that also works. It automatically will track any tracked property that's accessed inside this name getter. So if you have a service that itself has a thing marked as tracked, that thing will also invalidate the template. Uh, and it, it basically works the way you expect it to. Um, Okay, so uh, an example, so in that example, if you went from that, uh, that uh, the other Ember component to, to this class, you, you might also do these things. Now, we'll talk a little bit about these did insert and will destroy things in a minute. These are element modifiers. Uh, we'll get into the details of those shortly. But uh, the template of Glimmer components are, uh, it does not include the wrapping div like Ember component does. That's how we get rid of all of those tag name, attribute binding, class name bindings, class names, classes, uh, whatever, uh, methods, or properties. So, uh, so that's, that's great. Um, okay. So let's talk a little bit about the other supporting uh, cast, if you will, of the Glimmer component uh, world. Um, okay, so uh, named arguments uh, are really straightforward. Every curly invocation you've ever done, you've been passing named arguments. That's how to think about it. That's just what it is. Um, when, you, you, when you want to use them in the template, you, can, you have two choices. You can use this.post in the first example, or in, in, the, in the, the, the example here, or you can use um, at post. If you use at post, that's, a, that's using the named argument. That's using the reference directly passed to you from the call site. If you see this in the template, you know for sure that at post is not modified or have anything to do with the component JS or TypeScript that you're in the template you're in. It is all, it's directly from the call site. Um, and that's a really cool signal to have when you're reading the template to know, hey, this thing is from 
um, this thing is directly from the call side. I don't have to go and open the other JS file to see what's going on with like some computer property or whatever, uh, or if, if I'm mutating the state or anything like that. So that's really nice. And if, conversely, if you see this.post, your assumption should probably be, hey, there's some shenanigans here. There may be a getter. There may be some like I'm uh, com composing args that I was passed or something like that. Uh, but it's really nice uh, to have that signal in the template. Um, OK, next thing. I told you I was going to get back to these element modifiers. Uh, you're all familiar with element modifiers, even if you don't know it, because that's what action is. When you use action in an element space, um, not assigning it to something, but when you're just using it raw in element space, that is uh, an element modifier. Um, it's basically what bind adder was, if you remember those days. Um, yeah, I heard one person. Uh, all right, uh, so, so this is just, you know, hey, what if when this section is rendered, uh, you want to uh, call the performance.mark API, right? This is just a hypothetical uh, modifier you might have. But, um, but there's actually some, some actual modifiers that we added uh, in an add-on um, that are a part of the, the core experience um, called will, did insert, will destroy, and uh, did update. Um, and those, those basically are they're, they're really straightforward. They all take a function as an argument. Um, in this case, um, I'm using the action keyword to bind the context because by default the functions are unbound, um, which is a little bit um, of a thing to a stumbling block that we're trying to work on how to teach best. But the, the idea here is you pass it a function, that function is ran when this div is inserted. So that's why we don't need an insert element in the component JS anymore because you can make any element have its own did insert element basically uh, at any time. Um, and the, the beauty of that is, if you had this exact example, this was taken from the RFC, but if you had this exact example, um, and the this dot, the is open was toggled from true to false, um, most component code that I've seen would actually um, like have a, a leak. It would not tear down properly because there's no way to have a callback ran just when that thing toggles back and forth, right? So, um, so this is actually really, really nice to have uh, the ability to target any DOM element and have just an arbitrary function run when that element is uh, rendered or removed. Um, yeah. So, uh, okay, so here's another example. Now, this is an add-on. This isn't an official add-on, uh, but this uh, Ember on modifier add-on lets you do on. Now, I know this is going to be mind-boggling, but this is just like uh, add event listener on the element. That's it. Uh, that, that's all you're doing. You're giving it a function, run this function. Uh, when this element is clicked. Um, then uh, here's yet another add-on. Uh, this is called Ember OO modifiers. It lets you write your own, author your own modifiers with like class syntax. If you put this modifier here, um, when, um, when you render it like this, uh, it, it just uh, it sets the scroll top of the element like you see here. It's pretty straightforward. Now these are just add-ons. Like modifiers are a thing you can write, um, straightforward. I have one last modifier example. Um, this is Ember functional modifiers. If you're familiar with use layout effect or use effect in uh, React, this is akin to that. It lets you return a function that is your cleanup, um, and it just runs. And this, this is a little bit of a wacko code example for me to show, but like it's basically just moving randomly moving a, um, a button around the screen, which is, I'm sure, very lovely to use. Um, so, uh, so this is how you'd invoke it, and it, it would do the thing, right? Um, so, so modifiers are, are neat, um, and they let you do so many things that you, they're just much better for composition. You can let you do so many more things that you used to have to do sort of annoying, um, like, JS code to work around and deal with the uh, accessing the elements, finding the elements, flagging them, you like use this dot element, that query selector to find the element you're working on and all this jazz. All that can go away. You can just do directly, did insert, grab the element, do some code. It's great. Okay, so angle bracket invocation. Um, so I mentioned before that all the things you've ever passed in curlies were named, were, uh, were, uh, named arguments and this is where you can see that coming into play. So named arguments in the uh, curly case are, or sorry, in the angle bracket case, are just passed with an at in front of the name. Um, that's the main difference. Anything without an at is an attribute. Um, so, um, so in this case, uh, you've got show. This is a direct translation from show post. Um, the you see some nice benefits of 
using Engelbrecht invocation. You don't have to use like concat. You can just do a quote with some curlies and it just works. It's actually quite nice. Um, so some levels of nesting for you, that you would have to manually do to do concat, you just you get away with. You don't have to do that stuff anymore. Um, so that's, that's awesome. Um, other things, uh, this is another example. This data test post display property, um, you, know, you can imagine it's like Ember test selectors or something. Um, this thing, this uh, is not with an at, as you notice, but so that means it's passed as an attribute, and the attributes are directly splattered out onto the element uh, that you use on the inside of the component where you have dot, dot, dot attributes. So if a component, if you're draw, authoring a component, and you want to allow any arbitrary attribute to be passed, all you have to do is put dot, dot, dot attributes on the thing you want the, the caller side's attributes to pass to, uh, and that works. Um, I know this doesn't seem huge, but this is huge. Uh, so I have maintained components where I have 50 or 100 attribute bindings, and just continuing getting PRs to add another one and another one because I forgot one, or because they made up their own data property because that's what you're supposed to do with them. Uh, and uh, it's quite frustrating uh, because there's no other choice. I actually wrote a thing that dynamically build the attribute bindings uh, based on the arguments passed uh, that was very trippy. But anyways, um, this is awesome. Uh, this, this lets you work around loads and loads of things, like things that the component author just didn't think about or wasn't really the fundamental point of the component, but you, maybe you need to set a role or maybe you need to set um, like the test selector properties or any of those kinds of things. Um, this is great. Uh, all right, so the built-in components that we provide you, they have angle bracket versions as well. Um, they will be, um, well, they're not all done yet, but they will be uh, the ones I'm showing here. Um, it's a straight port. The, the, the point is you just take the thing you know from the angle bracket world and, uh, sorry, the curly bracket world and you use angles with the named args. There was no fundamental API changes to input or text area. Uh, there, there are some tweaks to link to, we'll get to that, but um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, some folks got a little bit confused uh, when we're talking about this, and that's because they thought um, originally, uh, the first time angle bracket invocation was proposed, we also proposed changing semantics, like changing fundamentals about the way it works to be read-only and one-way data flow, and we would tie the invocation style to the, um, to the programming, the, sorry, the way the thing was coded in the inside, and we realized that was just too big of a lift. It was too much change, and it meant that people just got stuck, um, and it was impossible to migrate a large code base along and along um, unless the calling side were just mirrors of each other, and uh, they were the same. So that, that's what we did, and, and, and that lets you change the invocation to be like all angle bracket, um, and then slowly migrate the components to the new base class as you're ready, um, and it doesn't have to happen all at once. Uh, so this is a text area example. Uh, again, it's basically the same. You just see we uh, use angle brackets, and we say at value instead of value. Um, no surprises here. Uh, now, here's where we get to link to. There's a little bit of differences with link to. Um, I've got a few examples here, but the basic just is link to took positional params, and I haven't mentioned it yet, but angle bracket invocation doesn't allow positional params um, as, as a thing. It's just not part of the angle bracket world because it doesn't map very well to um, HTML. Um, so um, I think this is a great change anyways, even if we were still using curlies to say route the route name equals that you care about instead of the positionals, because I always forget the order of those positionals, always, every time, and I get it wrong, and they get backwards. Anyways, so, um, so this is an example where you're not passing a model. Um, this is an example where you're passing a single model, um, and so you'll see you pass at model, uh, singular. Um, this is an example where you pass multiple models, um, and you pass at models, and you use the array helper to generate an array, and that's just your array of, of models. If you had an array that you built dynamically from your JS, you could use that too. There's nothing special about the array helper here. Um, this actually lets you dynamically update link to uh, in a way that was quite difficult to do before. Um, you can actually have a page that lets, uh, uses a, a dynamic route name, which has different sets of ordered args, uh, or sorry, model parameters for each one, and uh, gives you a way to do it. Um, that's it. Done. So, uh, so the, the, question, the question is, um, in an Ember component, you would use this.element or this.dollar, I guess. But um, 
to, to access the element, but in Glimmer components, you don't have this that element. There's no insert element. There's no obvious place to do that. The point of that, the entire idea here is that using element modifiers is a better composition story to do that. You can get the element. The element is passed into the element modifiers argument. Um, so if you did insert, for example, as an element modifier, um, that function gets the element as the first argument. And then any other args you pass, but they're curried. But um, the, uh, the idea here is that you can do much more. You can do everything you could do. Like I, I showed an example, ember.component, like uh, pretend migration, where you just said did insert, and uh, in did insert, you just called this dot did insert element. You can imagine that working. That's, an, that's a fine way to think about it. Um, but you could also imagine writing like a custom refs implementation where you grab all your elements and register them with some mutation observer thing and do all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, that would have been very hard to do or would have taken a lot of like JS imperative code to do before. So, so the, question, the question is um, if you're moving from ember.component to glimmer component, um, things that you would have used element ID to give you a guaranteed unique DOM ID, um, what do you do? Um, I think the answer is you write a helper that does plus plus on some number, and it's the same exact thing that we were doing for element ID. Um, but there's less cases where you care, right? Like, I, I agree that it's a thing you want to do and it's important to do, um, but the, we're adding IDs for every, uh, every Ember component today, and like, most of the time you don't use it. Ember itself doesn't even need it, right? So why are we littering the DOM with all this stuff? Every set attribute we have to do is slowing us down by X amount, right? Like it's all that stuff can go away, right? Um, so I think the, the short answer is just make your own and have it um, use, for example, you could make a helper that you pass the component into and ask, it, maybe it's called element ID and you pass the, the component, pass this into it. Um, and then use a weak map to make sure that you always get the same one for the component and it, it updates. That's just an example, free advice. Yes, okay, so the question is you have components in a subfolder and you want to invoke them. Uh, the angle bracket RFC, the, the RFC introducing angle bracket said, uh, you're, you're shit out of luck. Uh, <laughs> we subsequently realized that that was really stupid uh, and just merged an RFC and enabled a feature on Canary two or three days ago that lets you do it. Um, it is not quite as simple as the, what, you don't use a slash, you use colon colon to signify a subfolder. Um, but, uh, but yes, it is possible now. So we, we basically, it, it was a very clear adoption barrier. Um, and in Octane, we really, really wanted to tell people that you should basically always use angles. Like there's very few cases when you should be forced to use curlies. Things like, um, things like uh, control flow components may still be fine with Curlies, but for the most part, you're going to be wanting to write angle brackets because you get lots of other benefits. No, so great question. Thanks for asking. So, um, so in the talk, I talked about dot dot attributes, and um, uh, the question was whether you could like spread any random object, basically. Um, and the answer is no. Dot dot attributes is very special. Um, it's actually a custom attribute named dot dot attributes. Ha ha! Jokes on you. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and, and it's like a, there's a special opcodes in compilation. Now, that being said, it is almost certainly possible to use the same technique to implement that kind of thing for angle bracket invocation to let you have a component that takes arbitrary named arguments and pass them all to some other component. And I think that's a need. I think that's a, uh, a gap in the composition story that we have today. Uh, it's not new. It's not really about octane. It's just a, a thing where it's kind of annoying to take a component and Maybe you want to add a wrapper thing uh, to add some extra DOM or whatever, and then you have to go and call the original component and manually list every possible argument that's very frustrating. Um, so, yeah, so, so I think we should add a thing akin to that for dot, dot, dot arguments or something. Another thing to note that I didn't mention is that the attributes are not visible at all to the component you invoke. You can't see them unless you introspect your own element or something, I guess. Like you could like use a modifier to figure it out, but well, don't do that. Uh, the, the, the whole point is it's not something passed to you as an argument. You, don't, you can't mess with it. You can't add more. You can't selectively apply some to this element and some to that element. Um, it is, it is uh, sort of hidden from, from you, the component author. Yes. So, so the question is, do you have to add dot dot attributes? Um, the short answer is um, you have to in Glimmer components. Ember components have an implicit dot dot attributes on the root element of components you invoked. So, and, and the reason for that is because 
You don't actually have anywhere in your template to write that, because that's an implicit, like the div or whatever we give you automatically around Ember components. But in Glimmer components, there's no automatic dot dot attributes. If you don't want people to be able to customize your element, you just don't include it. Now, I think it's, I think personally that it's probably best practice to include it, unless you have a very good reason not to. Uh, uh, and I could imagine maybe that's a thing, but for the most part, I think you're, we're going to want to write it. And I think uh, we should, if we haven't, uh, a bozo button to the first person that makes an issue in the template lint repo to make a lint roll for it. Cool. Thank you.